So last class we saw that momentum was this vector P and it had units of kilogram meter per second. And we saw that there was conservation of momentum. Whatever momentum you start with is the momentum you end with. <coughs> and then we saw one application of this conservation of momentum. And today we're gonna see some more applications to this. And where this momentum is going to be important is in collisions. And so there are two types of collisions in physics. There is elastic collisions. And inelastic collisions. So in words, an elastic collision, elastic collision is when something or two things hit and bounce. And an inelastic collision would be when two things hit and stick together. And so there are varying degrees of these things. Um, if something is perfectly elastic, then then you know it's two things hitting and bouncing off of each other. And something is described as a perfectly elastic collision if energy is conserved. For any elastic collisions, uh, energy is not conserved. And I guess I should say mechanical energy And remember, mechanical energy is your kinetic and potential energy. So energy is always conserved if you include things like heat or sound. Uh, but if you want to just look at the potential and kinetic energy, then the for perfectly elastic collisions, the mechanical energy is conserved, and for any elastic collisions, the mechanical energy is not conserved. So let's look at an example of each of these two types of collisions. So for elastic collisions, we'll start off with an easy example. So we'll do elastic collisions in one dimension. My pen stopped working for some reason. 
So uh, something you could think about with elastic collisions is pool or billiards, if you've ever played that. So you have one ball, uh, that's the cue ball that you hit, and it's moving with some velocity v. It has some mass m1. And you're trying to hit another ball that could have a different mass m2 that is initially at rest. Let's say that this is maybe two meters per second. We'll say M1 is one kilogram and M2 is two kilograms. So you'll see I'm writing now the velocity with a subscript of one or two, so you know which mass I'm talking about. And then the I means that it's the initial picture. So then, so everything up here in black is the initial, and everything down here in red is the final picture. So M1 is going to hit M2. And then M2 is going to move with some final velocity. And M1 is going to come to a stop. Nope, oh, not M2. B one five. Okay, so looking at this picture. We can set up a conservation of momentum statement. So remember in any type of collision, your momentum is conserved. So we can always write this down. Our initial momentum. So if we write down the momentum of each ball, then the left side would look like that. And then the right side would look like this. Okay, so now we look through our problem. And if this was a word problem, it would have said all of these things in words. And then you would draw this picture uh, if you wanted to, to keep things straight in your head. Um, so we know that the ball one is moving to start with, so it has some momentum. And ball two is not moving to start, so this velocity is zero. And then in our final picture, we see that M1 stops moving and it transfers all of its momentum to ball two. So the velocity of ball one in the final picture is zero. So now we have M1, B1 initial equals M2, B2 final. And so we're trying to solve for B2 final. So we want to isolate that. So we'll get M1, B1 initial. divided by M2 
equals b to five. So if you plug that into your calculator, you would have m1 is one times two meters per second divided by two kilograms. That would give you one meter per second. And now because velocity is a vector and all of these momentums are vectors, this would be in the plus x direction because the initial momentum was all in the x direction. So the final momentum has to also be in the x direction. Yes. So because uh, because your momentum is a vector and we have to have conservation of momentum, if the, all of the momentum initially was in the x direction, then all of the momentum in the final picture also has to be in the x direction. So we'll show conceptually uh, what happens if things are moving in both the X and Y direction, uh, but we don't necessarily have time to solve all of that right now, but I'll link a video that shows how to solve a more complicated collision problem. Uh, but I think for this class, that might be a bit too, too complicated and not entirely necessary. So. Yes. What did I write the bottom where? Uh, that's a plus I hat. So that's telling you what direction it's in. So any questions about this? Okay. So we could So if we stay in one dimension, so this is still elastic in one dimension. And if we look at the same picture, M1, V1 initial. So we'll keep M1 the same. We'll keep V1 initial the same. Okay, so somebody in the chat asked if the momentum can be zero, and the answer is yes. Uh, so as long as, so uh, I'll show you in this problem. So we said V1 initial was two meters per second. And then mass two was sitting still. So it's V2 initial was zero. So the momentum of mass two initially is M2 V2 initial. And so since the velocity is zero, the momentum of this ball is zero. So yes, the, the momentum can be zero. And we have an example of that in this problem. So let's say that in the previous problem, they gave you M2 was zero, uh, but what if we did not, what if you were not given M2? So now we don't know M2, and we don't know V2 final. I guess maybe I'll draw the final picture. Uh, so the final picture will still be the same where M1 comes to a stop and then M2 starts moving at some final velocity. 
so now we're asking for B2 final, but we also don't know M2. And so because, so if we looked at our conservation of momentum, just like before, um, Uh, so we said that the momentum for mass two was zero initially, and the momentum for mass one is zero initially. And if we solve for V2 final, uh, we get the same thing that we had before. Only now we were not given this M2. So we need to uh, if we wanted to find V2, we have another unknown. So we have an equation with two unknowns. So whenever you encounter that situation, you need a second equation. And so we remember if this is a perfectly elastic collision, then energy is also conserved. So we can write down a conservation of energy statement. Oh, energy is not a vector. So one half m v one initial squared plus one m two v two initial squared one m two v m one E one final squared plus one half two into final squared. So just like before, where the initial velocity of mass two was zero, so that term goes away, and the final velocity of mass one is zero, so this term goes away. And we're left with one half m1 v1 initial squared equals one half m2 v2 final squared. So we still have two unknowns in this equation. But because they're the same unknowns as that we have in the other equation, now we can solve this system of equations. Generally, it's going to be easiest to solve your momentum equation for mass. So if I solved this for M2, it would look like this. And then I can take this mass and plug it into this equation for M2. So I'll do that on the next slide in a second. The reason that I'm doing it this way is because if I instead solve the, so I, there's, there's several ways that you can do this. Um, you can solve for the, so using the conservation of energy equation, you can solve for either mass two or the final velocity of mass two. If you solve for the final velocity of mass two, you're gonna have a square root in your uh, problem. And I don't like square roots, so that's why I don't do it that way. Uh, you could also solve for M2 and then plug that into your momentum equation. Or you can do, you can start with your momentum equation and then plug in either solve for V2 final, plug that into the energy equation, 
or solve for mass two and plug that into your energy equation. So there's really four, because there's two variables and two unknowns, there's four different ways that you could go about solving it. I tend to stick to solving for the mass because then I can avoid squaring or taking square roots of things with the velocity. So uh, when you practice this enough, you'll see, you'll get used to why you pick different things to make problem solving easier. Okay, so let's get to solving this. So we have M2 equals M1 V1 initial over V2 final. And then we had one half M1 V1 initial squared equals one half M2 V2 final squared. Okay, so we're taking this M2 and plugging it into the right-hand side of the equation. So that looks like this. And I'm gonna drop the vectors uh, because we, so, this mass term that we're replacing is not a vector, right? So you can't, when we're dividing these two vectors, you could imagine that the vector is canceling out if that helps you think about it. Uh, but so ignore the fact that these two were vectors initially. Okay, so now, you'll see that we have a V2 final on the bottom here and a V2 final squared on top. So this square can cancel with that term on the bottom. And then we have one half M1 V1 initial squared equals one half M1 V1 initial V2 final. Okay, there's an M1 on both sides. There's a one half on both sides. And there's a square over here that can cancel with this V1 initial. And so we're left with V1 initial equals V2 final. So if all we wanted to solve for was V2 final, then that would be your answer. So basically whatever uh, velocity the first ball hit the second ball with, the second ball is gonna take that velocity on. But the reason that that's true is now because we can solve for the mass of M2 from the equation up here that we used as our substitution, V1 initial, over V2 final. So if we plug in this for V2 final, then we get M2 equals M1 V1 initial over V1 initial. So you see that those two just cancel out and you're left with M2 equals M1. So the first one was a different Set up. So the first one, we told you what mass two was, and we told you that the first ball stopped moving and the second ball started moving. So this one, we didn't tell you the mass two or velocity two. So it's just a different setup to the problem. So we've seen one example where we use conservation of momentum to do an elastic collision. And now we've seen conservation of momentum and conservation of energy to do a uh, elastic collision, right? So you, you only need to invoke the conservation of energy if you run out of, like you end up in a situation where you have two unknowns. 
Craig. All right, so let's look at an example of an inelastic collision. And you've already seen an example of this. So the example that we did last time where you were throwing boxes off of your boat to try to go faster, that was an example of an inelastic collision. So it might be weird to think of you like separating two masses as a collision, but if you, so if we think about an inelastic collision as uh, collision where the mass of something changes, then the example we had, so the initial picture, you are on your boat, and maybe you are smuggling illegal things. We don't ask questions. Um, and you are trying to make your boat go faster. You threw all of these boxes off of your boat. And you found that what, whatever initial velocity you had before, you found that your final velocity was bigger than your initial velocity. So that was what the math showed us last time. And what the way you can think about this as a collision is if you think about it in reverse, this is kind of like you colliding with this bunch of boxes and them adding weight to your boat. So the reverse of that, you having boxes on your boat and throwing them off the boat is like a collision in reverse, right? So uh, it's kind of weird to think of this as a collision maybe, but it is a collision. So, so we've seen an example where you start off with more mass and then you have less mass and it makes you go faster. Uh, so let's see an inelastic collision where two masses start separately and then they come together. So you could think of this like a car crash example. So if you have one car and one, let's say that's a thousand kilograms moving at 10 meters per second. And then we have a slightly bigger car and two moving at a slightly slower velocity. And this is your initial picture. And then in the final picture, these two things hit together and they kind of got smushed together. And we want to know what the final velocity of these things are right as they hit. So if we start with our, oh, and the red is the final picture. And so these 
guys are now stuck together. So any type of collision, our conservation of momentum is true. The initial momentum of both of these things looks like this. And then the right-hand side, we can write it the same way we did previously. But if these two things are stuck together, what can we say about the final velocity of mass one and mass two? Yeah, so we know that B1, uh, I guess I'll do that in red. We know that because they're stuck together, V1 final has to equal V2 final. So then if we replace this with just V final, then we can uh, factor out the V final and write it like this. So now on the right-hand side of the equation, we only have one unknown because we used some logic to say that if these things are stuck together, then they have to have the same final velocity. So if we're solving for the that final velocity, we would now divide both sides by M1 plus M2, and we would get a final uh, answer in terms of variables that looks like this. And now on the next slide, I'm gonna show you how we compute this because the fact that these are vectors is going to influence the answer. So this eight meters per second is directed to the left and this 10 meters per second is directed to the right. So the momentum of mass one is in the positive X direction and the momentum of mass two is in the negative X direction. So when you add vectors together, you have to take into account the direction that they're pointing. So this was our solution. M1 we said was a thousand. Uh, the initial velocity was 10 in the plus I hat direction. So I'll just leave this as positive. Or I guess I'll do a 10 plus I hat. And then mass two, we said was 1500. The velocity was eight, and that was in the negative I hat direction. M1 and M2 are a thousand plus. So now because the initial momentum was positive and the, or the initial momentum of mass one was positive and the initial momentum of mass two is negative, we have to subtract those two. So this would be 10,000 minus whatever, the other thing is so a thousand minus ten minus fifteen hundred times eight. <laughs> 
So we get negative 2000 on the top and then divided by 2500 on the bottom. So V2 final would be negative 0 0.8 meters per second <clears throat> in the X direction. So the negative sign is telling us that's in the negative X direction. Okay, so if we look back at these, uh, at the setup of this problem, so we said that the, they were moving in opposite directions and then they hit each other. We could have said that the mass two was moving to the right. So they're both moving to the right, but they still hit each other. Oops. Then you would see that this, when you went to plug the algebra and the physics would still be the same up to this point. But then when you plug your numbers in, if the initial velocity of mass two was in the positive direction, then you would add these two things together instead of subtracting them. And so you would get a different answer completely. So that's why the paying attention to what direction each velocity and therefore momentum is pointing is important. Uh, if we look, if we had the same kind of problem, but they were moving now in two dimensions. So this was your initial picture. Then your final picture, you would see that when these things stick together, They would be moving together at some final velocity. And because the, the initial momentum of one is in the X direction and the initial momentum of the other is in the Y direction, when you add two vectors that are not in the same direction, uh, remember you have to add the components together and then the final velocity would be in both the X and Y directions. Okay, so I think uh, we can come back to this maybe in the homework uh, when you have collisions in two dimensions. And then, like I said, I'll, I'll post a video where I show how to do elastic collisions in two dimensions, and it can be quite a lot of, of algebra, um, but it's worthwhile to see how to do that. And then one more thing about momentum that I wanted to touch on. Is called impulse. And so I think you saw some of this in when we were talking about forces. So remember I said that the force is related to the change in momentum over change in time. And so if you have a force acting on something for a small amount of time, you'll sometimes see that called an impulse. 
And so this is, you can think of this, for example, if you, if you have someone say falling from some kind of height or two cars hitting each other or a car hitting a barrier, the fact that the force of the car hitting that barrier acts over a really short time is going to give you, uh, or I guess I should say it the other way. The fact that the, so, if you have a car hitting a wall, the fact that you go from some initial velocity that's pretty big to some final velocity that's zero, and that happens in a very short amount of time, then the force that you feel is very big. So uh, things like uh, your car having a crumple zone that uh, lengthens the duration of the collision or uh, another example, if you were falling from some height and when you landed, you kind of bent your legs and then rolled as you hit the ground. Those are all things that are extending the time of that collision, that impact. And so making the delta T bigger is going to make your force smaller. Uh, so we'll see. I can show some more examples of this later. Um, but just some practical applications of momentum and how it applies to force and this thing called impulse.